Let's begin. Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Though the story may have had a clear beginning that left us with misdirection, it seems to have no end. And tonight, we jump right back into the fun. So sit back, relax, and get ready for No End House, Part 2 of 2. Immediately after slicing down my wrist, I was no longer in room 5. I didn't die. I knew that for sure. The, the depression was gone, but I was by no means happy. Tears were still finding their way down my face. The room I was in was similar to the one previous, and again, it had no doors. There wasn't any lamps, but somehow I was still able to see everything clearly. The room was completely empty, but before I had time to think of what to do next, it went dark, and the hum from before returned. I covered my ears in protest. It was louder than it ever was, but it was over in a moment, and the lights returned, only this time something was added to the room, and then I screamed. There, in the middle of the room, strung up by chains, and naked from the waist up, was David. It looked like he was tortured. Knife wounds littered his chest and arms. David! I ran up to him as fast as I could. He was conscious. I saw his chest move up and down, but he wasn't speaking. And that's when I noticed what was etched into his chest. I dropped to my knees as I saw it. The seven stared at me as though it had eyes. I heard David try and speak. I got to my feet and got as close as I could to him. David? David, can you hear me? Maggie, what, what are you doing here? His voice was slight, but he was talking and I was thankful for that. David, I, I'm trying to save you. How do I get you down? There were large padlocks in the chains holding him in place. I looked around the room for any sort of key, but all I found was a small knife in one of the corners. The metal was way too thick for that knife to even dent it, so I disregarded it as useless. I went back to David. It looked like he was on the verge of death, and then I felt my pocket vibrate. It startled me something awful. I took the phone out of my pocket. As I suspected, one unread text. I flipped open the phone. That isn't me. I didn't know what to think. David was right there in front of me, but that text was from the first number that contacted me. It was the first text I received from David that mentioned the no-end house. Maggie. I heard his voice clearly with my ears and my mind. It seemed like his voice was coming from all sides. Maggie, you have to go on. What are you talking about? How? I was face to face with David or whoever it was that was chained up there. That knife. He made a slight movement of his head toward the corner. Go get it. I ran and was immediately back with the knife clenched in hand within a few seconds. I had no idea what was going on. But I needed to save him and would do any- Now stab me in the chest. What? I was shocked. David hung there, staring directly into my eyes. You have to run that knife through the seven on my chest. It's the only way to save us both. No. I stumbled backward. No. You're not making any sense. Maggie! He was screaming now. His eyes looked frantic. The side of his mouth curled into a twisted grin. Maggie, stab me now. It's the only way. I looked down at the knife in my hand. My head felt as though it was being struck with a bat. 
I was at a complete loss. I clenched my eyes shut tight and felt the knife in my hand. Maggie! And with a scream and a thrust, I stabbed the knife into David's chest. I don't know what came over me. I just knew it was the only way. I opened my eyes and saw his face. It was terrified. Tears slid down his cheeks and David looked me in the eyes. Why did you do that? He couldn't fool me. I know that wasn't David. It couldn't have been or else I wouldn't have been able to stab him. I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't. His eyes rolled back as the life left him. But that's when it changed. The seven on his body was gone. The blood dripped down onto the ground into a pool below me. The crimson liquid stretched out in every direction. The circle nearly filled the room, and I began to sink. I tried to move, but I couldn't. It was like quicksand. Blood was up to my knees now. As much as I tried to struggle, I just sank deeper. Up to my chest now. I clawed and scratched at the wood around me. The lifeless body of David hung above, his head facing me, smiling. The blood reached my neck. I was beyond terrified. Before long, I was fully submerged and fell into darkness. When I woke up, I was outside the house. I could feel the cold earth below me. I rolled onto my back and looked up at the night sky. The no-end house towered above me, complete with my car parked in the same spot. I wasn't sure whether I should laugh or cry. I was out. I was out. I was out. I was out. I got up and dusted off my pants. My body was still shaking as I walked to my car, but a feeling of uneasiness washed over me. There was no way I escaped. The house wouldn't just let me go. Something wasn't right. I knew it. I knew I didn't kill David in the sixth room. I knew I didn't, but he was nowhere to be found. I reached down in my pocket, took out my phone. No unread messages, but I had service. I flipped it open and I began to text to David. Where are you? I wrote. Within a second of sending it, I got a reply. I pressed open excitedly. Room 10. Your room seven, run, and the deafening hum returned. I bolted. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I wasn't outside. I was still in the house. The hum rattled everything around me. It shook the trees and the air itself. I just needed to find an eight. I needed to find the next room. That was my only chance. I needed to find room eight. The first few rooms are obvious, but as I progressed, it was getting less and less clear where the room started and ended. I had no idea what I was looking for. Anything that had a number on it. I needed to find an eight. I needed to find an eight. I needed to find... Unread text. Your address. What the hell did he mean? My address? I slid the phone back in my pocket. The hum was growing louder and louder. And that's when it hit me. My address. My address? My address. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. 4896. Forest Lane. Unit 8. I slammed into my car and flung the door open. The hum shook the metal of the car and seemed to follow me inside. I floored it and made my way back down the dirt road toward my apartment. None of this was making sense. How was room 8 my apartment? Should I have even trusted that text? It was from David. I know it was. There was no reason not to trust it. It took no time at all to drive to my complex, and honestly, I didn't even remember driving. It's like when you zone out for a minute and wake up farther down the road. I didn't even bother locking it as I ran up to the front gate. My hands fumbled with the keys as I unlocked the bolt and made my way into the first hallway on the left. My complex was huge, but my apartment was one of the first ones on the left. I ran as fast as I could, past four, past five. My head was spinning. This night was weighing down on me like a lead vest. Past six. The further I made it down the hallway, the further away the hum seemed to be. As I passed unit seven, I could barely hear it anymore. And when I stopped in front of my unit, I was in complete silence. I just stood there, standing in front of my apartment. 
the small gold eight was at eye level with me. I reached for the doorknob and slowly slid my key in, twisted, and the door swung open. I was sucked in like a vacuum, the door slamming behind me. Room eight. I got up off the floor and looked around. It was identical to my apartment. If I didn't know any better, I would have assumed that I was home and and this was a bad dream. My mind went to David and wondered what room eight was to him, what it was that the house showed him. I walked around and studied the area. Literally everything was how I left it, right down to the half-eaten Chinese left out next to the sink. I looked over at my computer desk in the family room. The monitor was still on and AIM was still up and running. I walked over and sat in front of it, scrolling through my conversation with Peter. It was there, word for word. The house knew all of this, and how I had no idea. To be honest, I tried my hardest not to think about it. The answer, no doubt, something I was better off not knowing. I tried to click out of aim, but it wouldn't let me. The computer just froze. I clicked shut down, nothing. I clicked control alt delete, nothing. I pressed the monitor's power button, nothing. And then a pop-up appeared on screen. It was a video chat. I looked at the list of people in it, and there were two names, Maggie and management. The video feed was live, and all it showed was a gray wall. Then a message from management popped into a text box. Hope everything is how you left it. Who are you? I responded. Enjoy the show. And that's when the camera turned. The camera focused on a young man strapped to a surgical table. He was completely naked and sobbing quietly to himself. The image wasn't that clear, but I thought I had recognized the man laying there. He was tall, short brown hair, and a fairly pale complexion. This is what happens when people attempt to cheat. That's when I realized who it was. Strapped to the surgical table was Peter Terry, and he wasn't alone. I don't want to describe what I watched at that moment. The screams, the sounds that Peter made were unlike anything I've ever heard out of a human. I couldn't look away. I wanted to, but I think it was the power of the room. I couldn't look away. Peter let out one final, soul-curdling scream, but I didn't hear it through the computer speakers. It was coming from my room. My heart sank as I spun around towards the hallway. I got up off my chair. I could still hear the screams emanating as I walked towards its source. I reached my bedroom door and the screams were now replaced by the hum. That hum. It had haunted me the entire time. I slowly opened the door. I saw inside my room what I had seen on the computer. There was a surgical table with whatever was left of Peter Terry strewn across its top. No one else was there. The others in the room were gone, but a chill went up my spine. The management was here with me, only one room away. I walked closer to the table. The stench was horrific and it took everything in me to stop from vomiting. I knew I was nearing the end. I had to be. I looked around the room. Somewhere in here was the entrance to the next room. I knew it had to be. And it was. But it was simpler than I expected. Across the room, where my bathroom door should have been, was a simple wooden door. Similar to the earlier ones in the house. Something was stapled to the door. Something long and bloody. It was the entrails of Peter Terry, and they formed a nine on the door. I felt bad for Peter, but I had gone through hell that night. I walked right past the table, picked up a long surgical knife, and didn't give the body a second glance. The final door was there, and I walked right up to it. 
this night was about to end, and I was coming out of that room with David, and I was going to stop whoever it was that was keeping him here. The door opened easily, and as I stepped through, I saw what was waiting for me. It was an empty room. It resembled a waiting room for a doctor's office. There were a few chairs lining the wall, crumpled up old magazines in a basket in the corner. Across the room, on the opposite side from where I came in, there stood a single door. My heart sank when I read the label printed on the wood. It wasn't a number. It was a single word. Management. I clenched the surgical knife in my hand. All right, I'm fucking ending this. They were on the other side of the door. I could feel it, and David was too. The hum was louder than it had ever been. I could feel it inside me. It was coming from inside me. As I walked, it got louder. As I placed a hand on the door, the room was filled with the sound. I turned the knob and opened the door. The room waiting for me was not what I expected. It was the front lobby. The same front lobby that began this entire hell. Only this time, there was someone behind the desk. My heart jumped out of my chest. When I saw who it was, it was Peter Terry. Peter? Hello, Maggie. No, there was no way. How? What? Who are you expecting? A ghost? Satan? Some creepy little blonde girl? He was smiling. I wasn't. What the hell is going on here? Maggie, come on. Just think for two seconds. Who first told David about this place? You didn't. Who told you about David's whereabouts here? God damn it, Peter! You were his friend! I'm sorry, Maggie. But that's how we run business here. Where is he? He's in here with us, in the house, Maggie. He isn't going anywhere. N neither are you. Where is he? I don't know what took over me, but I lost it. I jumped over the counter and shoved Peter to the ground. I grabbed him by the hair and slammed his head into the ground. The surgical knife in my other hand pressed firmly against his neck. I wanted to kill him. I had to kill him. He killed David. He wasn't killing me. No. Maggie, you can't. There's always going to be someone to run the house. I slid the knife across his throat and slammed his head further into the ground. I don't think there will be. With his death, the room went dark. I could still feel the surgical knife, but I was no longer holding on to Peter's hair. I don't know for how long I was in the darkness, but it felt like ages. I stood and felt for the desk, balancing myself with one hand on the side of the marble surface. Then the lights came on. I could see the windows across the room. It was still night out. I looked out and saw him. David was walking around outside, seemingly unharmed. I ran to the door and tried to open it. I was so happy, but the door wouldn't budge. I tried my hardest, but the door wouldn't let me out. I looked out the window and saw David as he began to walk down the dirt road. I rested my head against the door and saw it. My stomach lurched hard. There pinned to my chest was a name tag with one word management well if you think you know where this is going you're probably dead wrong so don't go anywhere too far and make sure you return next week for more gorerific fun and until then make sure to like share subscribe and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>
social media can be very unpredictable, especially regarding horror content. If this content gets removed, all new content will be simultaneously presented on various websites provided in the description to this video. Make sure to follow me in other digital spaces so that you never miss out on the terror. Also, if you like this video, make sure to leave a comment and hit the like button. It helps the channel a lot. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy what's here, consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Writing is a dream of mine, and it's all of you that make that dream come true.